Everybody needs a mallet for whacking things, and today we're going to make three of them. A small, a medium, and a large one based on this guy that I made 30 years ago. So I made this mallet 30 years ago when I was in school, and it is a very simple mallet. It is made out of three pieces of wood. Two pieces make the top half and those are glued together with this groove already cut in there. And then this piece, the handle, which has a slight taper on it, fits down in that hole and then simply locks in there. This is gonna be the size of the medium mallet, so I'm replacing this mallet with my new one. There'll be one that is smaller than that. I've had a smaller mallet in the past, lost it somewhere along the way, would really like to have that again, that's nice. And I've always wanted to have a larger mallet uh, just in case for larger things to hit and heavier head to hit them with. So we are going to do that. We're going to get them all out of this one piece of curly maple and I'll be able to get the large head, the medium head, the small head, and then the three handles will come out of the bottom part of the board. So let's get to it. Before we get to the machine, let me show you the cutting list that I'm working from. The center row there, the one with the star on it, that is the mallet that I have. And so those are the dimensions that I took off of that mallet. And then I reduced the smaller one by about 78% and I increased the larger one by 121%. That is just based on adding three inches to the handle length and reducing three inches from the handle length and then taking everything else proportionally. The thickness of the handle I kept the same. You'll notice the width of the handle, it says one and one eighth inches. That is the dimension at the bottom of it, and then it tapers at 1.5 degrees. When it comes to the head width, you'll notice that there is a second line underneath there, and that is what the thickness of each of the two halves has to be in order to get that dimension. And if you are astute and paying attention, you'll notice that I messed up the calculation on the larger mallet. It should be 1 in 13 sixteenths. The first thing I need to do is to true up one of the edges and then separate the handle stock from the headstock. Trued it up on the joiner and took it over to the table saw and ripped off the handle portion of the board. I then cut that handle portion in half into two boards. One of those boards ended up being for the longer handle and then both the medium and the small handle came out of the other half. Then was able to head over to the planer and thickness those both down to the three quarter inch dimension that they needed to be. With the handle thickness, I was able to turn my attention to the initial milling of the head pieces. First thing I needed to do was to cut this into three pieces because each head has to be thickness to a different dimension. So I cut that into three equal pieces and I headed over to the planer. The board was already at the thickness for the larger mallet. I then dimensioned the other two pieces to the thickness they needed to be for the medium and the small mallet. I was then back over to the workbench to lay out the taper on the handle. The taper on this handle is only 1.5 degrees. It's not very much. In order to get that taper, I actually replicated the two dimensions on the current handle that I have which is one and one eighth at the narrow end and one and one half at the wider end. And those two dimensions need to be 14 inches apart. And so I replicated those dimensions on the longest handle and then drew a knife line connecting those points over the entire distance of the handle. I'm working with a knife line here because it needs to be a fairly accurate dimension and I can work much more accurately with a knife line than I can with a pencil line. Over at the bandsaw, I simply follow the taper with the bandsaw and I'm cutting to within a 32nd to a 64th of an inch. I then take the piece over to the joiner and I'm actually probably cutting about a 64th off per cut over at the joiner. It allows me to make sure that the taper is exactly the taper that I want it to be, that one and one and a half degrees. I then take the long handle with the taper on it and I transfer the angle to the other two handles using a knife for accuracy. And then I repeat the bandsaw and the joining process on those to get the finished taper on those handles. The 
before laying out the joint for the handle and the heads, I wanted to true up what is going to be the gluing surface with a hand plane, and so I quickly did that. Each of the three pieces that I'll be getting the heads out of has two halves of the heads, and so I start off by drawing a center line for each of those halves of the head. Then I lay out one edge of the joint. The 1.5 degree for the handle has to be cut in half for this, so it's actually uh, three quarters of a degree that I have set on my protractor square, and I knife line that. I then set my sliding T-bevel to that three quarters of a degree, and using the handle as a gauge for the width, I mark the other edge of the dado joint. You'll notice that the handle is actually hanging off the end of the board several inches. And I do that just to make sure that I don't cut the dado too wide. If you cut the dado too wide, the handle will fall through or go in too far into the head. If you cut it too narrow, you can simply take a couple passes with a hand plane in order to make it fit better. Then finally, I mark out the bottom of the dado with a cutting gauge and I transfer the lines around the edge of the board with a square and a knife. I did the initial cut on the edge of the dados with a Japanese saw. That allowed me to get about a 64th away from the knife line and made it very easy to pare the edges down with a chisel. This also makes it easier when I'm routing out the waste with a router. It makes it so that I'm not so likely to route into the edge with the router bit. When it comes to routing out the dados, slow and steady wins the race so that you do not route outside of the area that you should be routing. You also want to take care in setting the depth of the router because anything that you are off in this case gets multiplied by two when you put the two halves together. If it is a little bit too deep on one, it's going to be very noticeable on two. I then sharpened my chisel and went about paring the edges of the dado and cleaning up the bottom so that it was flat. This is one of the places where having a really good and nicely defined knife line will reap rewards as it'll actually give a place for your chisel to locate when you're doing the pairing and it makes it much, much easier. The final fitting of the handles into the head before glue up takes a little bit of time. There's some give and take. As soon as you put the handle in there, it's really obvious if there's anything wrong with your dado at all, whether it's the bottom not being flat or the edges that were paired not being absolutely square, it all shows up. And so some give and take happens going back and forth between doing some more chiseling and trying it again and cleaning up a little more. Also at this point, I did some initial fitting of the handle so that the handle fit well and sat down into the dado uh, far enough so it was not sticking out quite so much as it did after first cutting the dado. Once the handles were fitting well in each of the heads, it was time to move on to the glue up. The handles themselves will be used to locate the two halves of the heads to each other. Because of this, it's important that they get waxed well so that they do not end up sticking to the mallet head during the glue up process. I just use some paste wax for this and then rub it off and then it is time to move on to spreading some glue. I'm just using Type-On regular wood glue for this and I'm spreading it with a 16th inch piece of veneer that I just threw away at the end of it. You'll notice that I'm spreading glue on both sides of the joint. I do that just to make sure that the joint doesn't end up being a dry joint. Sometimes when you spread glue only on one side of a joint, the dry wood on the other side of the joint will actually wick away enough of the water that it creates a dry joint. So you see me inserting the handle back into the head before the head is fully clamped down and that's to locate the two halves of the head so they are aligned perfectly with one another during the clamping process. It works really well. Again, the only caveat, make sure your handle is waxed. I started out thinking I was gonna be using two clamps per head and I ended up putting four on there. 
So while you're cleaning up the glue, it's important to knock that handle out once so you can clean the glue up from inside the mortise and also from off of the handle. And then reinsert the handle again for the remainder of the drying process. After the glue set for several hours, I took the clamps off and then I could begin the shaping of the heads. The first thing there is to flatten the bottom of the head. During the gluing process, the two halves did not line up precisely, so it just takes a quick trip to the edge sander to clean up the bottom surface of the head. I was then able to start laying out the shape of the head of the mallet. I started by finding the center point of the mortise for the handle and then measuring in each direction until I got to the width of the head. Once I had the width of the head set, I was able to set my sliding T-bevel up to four degrees, which is the angle of the face of the mallet off of the bottom, and mark those on each of the mallets. I ended up just using the existing mallet in order to get the shape of the top curve of the head. I was pretty happy with that, and it was easy enough just to trace that onto the head of the mallet. And it was back over to the bandsaw to cut out the heads. All of my layout was done with a number four pencil. The number four pencil is a harder pencil than the standard number two pencil that is most common here in the United States. And when that is sharpened to a point, I'm able to get a very clean and a very small line with it. I use it a lot for layout in the shop. And so once I was at the bandsaw, it was just a matter of cutting as close to that line as possible. I'm usually working within a 32nd of an inch when I'm cutting for something like this. It makes the cleanup on the sander very easy. I cleaned up all the bandsaw marks with 80 grit on the oscillating edge sander. I set the miter gauge on the edge sander to 4 degrees to sand the faces of the mallet with. And for the tops I just followed the pencil line, which means that it's very important that your layout line be very accurate. And then I switched out to 180 grit and I went back over all of the surfaces with that. 180 grit on the edge sander leaves a smooth enough finish that I can then go to hand sanding directly from there. The next step is to mark out the finished lengths of the handles. I left all the handles when I cut them originally two inches long. I did that because due to the small angle of the taper, just a very small difference in the width can make a big difference with how far down or how not far down into the mortise that it sits. But at this point, with everything glued together and the mortises fully set in their place, it is time to put those to their final length. I left about 5 eighths of an inch out of the top of each one of the heads. You don't want to leave the handle flush with the top of the head because if there is any shrinking in the handle due to environmental conditions, then it's going to start going down into the head. I cut the handles to length on the miter saw. The saw needed to be set at 3 quarters of 1 degree angle in order to be correct. That accounts for half of the 1.5 degree taper that is on the handle. Then it was over to the router table to put a chamfer on the handle in the place where the handhold is. I made this to match the existing handle and it does not go the full length and so it stops and it starts. And so I had some pencil lines on the handle so I knew where to stop and where to start. While I was at the router table, I also put a chamfer on the heads. They did not go on all sides of the head. The top and the bottom face of the head were left without chamfers. And that is really because that's the way the original mallet was when I made it 30 years ago. The chamfers on the handle required some cleaning up. Off of the router, they were just kind of a scooped end left over from the router bit. And I wanted to crisp them up to a nice clear 45. I did that with a chisel and pretty much to eye and it looks pretty good. The original mallet had a hole in the handle and while I have usually kept it in a drawer with three of them, they're going to need to get hung up someplace and so I decided to keep with the original design and to put a hole in the handle. Did it at the drill press with a 3 16 drill bit and then following that with a chamfer bit. 
Then we were down to the hand sanding. I ended up being able to do most of my sanding just with 280 grit sandpaper. Again, the 180 grit on the oscillating edge sander worked very well prior to doing that. There were also several faces which I was able to take right off of the hand plane. I was very surprised with the curly maple. It actually responded very well to hand planing and I had almost no issues with tear up. Just for reference, the area of the handle that goes through the mortise does not get chamfered at all and only got rounded over very so slightly with the 280 grit sandpaper. It is meant to be left square where it goes through the handle. The original mallet was finished with boiled linseed oil. I am using a concoction that I quite frankly have no idea what it is. It's definitely got a lot of boiled linseed oil in it. I think it has a little bit of turpentine or paint thinner in it and I think it also has some amount of polyurethane in it as well. I guess I need to do a little bit better job of marking my finishing jars that don't have labels on them. I ended up putting three coats of finish on these. On the second coat I ended up wet sanding it with 600 grit sandpaper and it is nice and it is smooth. I topped it off with a coat of finishing wax and I am very happy with what it looks like at this point. And there you have them. The three mallets are done. The only thing left is to get the nerve up to hit something with them and ruin the perfection that currently exists on their faces. But that day is coming, so... Again, this is Todd Wolf from Made by Wolf, encouraging you to get out into your space and to make something today.